Hey everybody, before I start the vlog this week, I kind of want to put out a little tiny disclaimer. I go to a Civil War museum, and there's a ton of Civil War iconography abound. It's, it's everywhere, but I feel like whenever I talk about the subject, I handle it very tastefully. So I just kind of wanted to give you a heads up before the video starts. So, with that being said, enjoy the vlog. Hey guys, how's it going? Today we are going to go check out a museum. Now I don't know if you remember a few months ago, whenever I went down to uh, the downtown Marietta Square with my buddies Tim and Monica, we talked about the Kennesaw House, also known as the Marietta Museum of History, and we talked about the great locomotive chase and how uh, a very famous locomotive by the name of the General that was stolen there. Well, today we're going to go check out a museum that really showcases the General. Uh, we'll learn a little bit about the Civil War and how it kind of intertwines with the story of the General and the Great Locomotive Chase. So, let's go check it out. This is where we were standing, but if we take a short walk right across the street, there's the museum. So let's go take a closer look. Here we are at the Southern Museum of Civil War and Locomotive History in association with the Smithsonian Institution. Something that's really interesting about its affiliation with Smithsonian was that uh, it's not uncommon for a museum to be associated with the Smithsonian. However, this one had its affiliation before this was completely built. So I find that was pretty interesting. Also, I should note that living in North Georgia uh, the Civil War was very prominent here. The Civil War affected a lot of people. So you can't really go a block without tripping over some kind of Civil War history. Uh, there's a lot of it around. It's literally in people's backyards here. I was telling you guys outside about how it has a Smithsonian affiliation program here. And this is all of the information just kind of stating that the museum has X amount of objects and how both institutions work hand in hand to bring you the information in the history of, uh, of the Civil War. Walking in the door here, you see this grand statue of CSA General Joseph Eggleston Johnson. And if we turn this way, there's two more statues. Let's see who these guys are. He's Nathan Bedford Forrest and this gentleman right here is John Bell Hood. Also, I've always been a really big fan of the 19th century pose of putting your hand inside your jacket like this. Uh, I want to have a portrait of me doing this one day. And here's another statue right here. Let's see who this guy is. John Brown Gordon. And this guy right here is a man by the name of General Robert Edward Lee. Hmm, never heard of him. I'm joking, of course. Uh, this man was the Confederate General of the Confederate Army. Right here on this wall, we have this long timeline of America from 1793 all the way to 1865, really showcasing events that led up to and, and happened during the Civil War. And it starts here in 1793 with Eli Whitney inventing the cotton gin. And if we follow all of these things that we're just, you know, so casually, lightly brushing over all the way to December 18th, 1865, where the 13th Amendment finally ratified to uh, abolish slavery. This area it's really kind of showcases, uh, before the hard divide between the North and South, how much soldiers had in common. And there's these little pie charts here that show uh, what kind of uh, occupations of people in the 19th century held before the breakout of war and the states were divided. There's also some photographs here, as well as some handwritten documents.
That one's not handwritten there. Here we have a panel here about the Civil War beginning with those fateful shots fired at Fort Sumter on April 12th, 1861. Here are some old artifacts of some handguns that were used during the Civil War. Uh, look at this one. 1842 pistol. And how this really ties into the railroad is that the railroad played a really key part in the movement of troops. And not only the movement of troops, but also uh, the movement of materials needed to fight the American Civil War. So we're probably going to see a little bit of that as well as we walk through the exhibit. Again, it'll be new to me, just as it is new to you, because I have not been here for at least 10 years. So let's go continue seeing what we can find. There's a shot of a Union Railroad shipping out a lot of materials. I know a second ago we saw some handguns of the Civil War, but here we have some rifles of the Civil War. I really like this exhibit right here because it shows the drums and this really cool old trumpet that were used during the marches as the armies marched people would play these instruments and uh, a lot of people might not know but a lot of these early marches eventually kind of down the line evolved into what was ragtime and then ragtime then evolved into what we now know as jazz and blues Also, I kind of want to point out all of these murals that we've been seeing, all these really amazing paintings, these great pieces of artwork. And this one right here was done by a man named Don Troiani, and uh, I guess that's his website, but yeah, that, that artwork is stunning. Here, this panel is really just talking about how the two different armies utilized the railroad. You can see pictures of railroads being built and uh, how you had to quickly and efficiently build the railroad because there was also a good chance that the opposing side could destroy a railroad. Again, they used the railroad to supply not only troops but also materials for the war. So railroads were very, very important. And if you lost one, it could be very detrimental. And right here we see some artifacts from a Confederate soldier who had some die and some playing cards and what appears to be a small bible if I'm not mistaken. A nice whiskey flask back there and right here we see some Union soldier artifacts and a lot of items that they carried throughout the war. So a razor, looks like a little pocketbook, a mirror. Here, this panel just details more of what I was talking about earlier about how you had to guard the rails from sabotage. We have a soldier here, a mock soldier, guarding the rails, a little lantern. Unfortunately, war is the one reason we see a lot of evolution and leaps and bounds as far as research and development for new technologies. And if you compare these newer arms to the ones we saw earlier, you can see how they've evolved throughout the time of the Civil War. Right here, oh, you can see my reflection. Hey guys, I see a Union soldier's jacket. And right here, here's a dress. Let's see, who, who wore this one? Uh, women's day dress. This dress was worn during daily activities. It consisted of two pieces. Simple decoration suggests it was made in the South.
I'm not going to read every single one of these because we would be here literally all day. But I'll try to give you the rundown. And right here is a toddler dress. Now these dresses were actually worn by both little boys and little girls up into until about a certain age. And here we have a section of battle flags and right here there is a flag right here from a Georgia garrison it looks like. Now I want to note there is a lot of controversy about this flag or variations of this flag right now in the country due to a lot of socio-political strife uh, but I, I, I kind of want to take a second and talk about it because I think out of everywhere this flag is displayed, the one appropriate place that it should be displayed is in a museum in the context of its time. And I say that because it's history, and history happened. It's important to know the events of the past, but also use the events of the past and know how to be better for tomorrow. There's a panel here called Atlanta Falls, and it's showcasing the Atlanta campaign of General Sherman, who walked all the way, <laughs> I say walked, he marched with his troops all the way to the Savannah coast here in Georgia. Uh, and on his way, he hit all of these major cities and pretty much burned them all to the ground. And Atlanta was not an exception. I know it seems like I'm jumping around a lot. There's not really a focused timeline here, so please bear with me. <laughs> there will be some jumping around, but we're really here to see the general, which we'll get to soon. At the end of the Civil War, the railroad was starting to be utilized for more commercial purposes. Again, as you can see, logging here in the South was something that was very important. There was a lot of lumber in these forested areas, and clearing these out for lumber was a very big economic point here in the South. And if I turn over this way, we see this gentleman standing in what looks to be like an industrial factory, or outside of an industrial factory. Kind of expanding on what I was talking about earlier, this area talks about how Northerners were starting to utilize the railroads and having stakes in businesses in the South. So a lot of their business, as far as materials, or even running it in person, utilized on the railroads going back from North to South after the country had been reunified. I also should mention, and it's no surprise, that during the what is known as the Reconstruction Era in the South, post-Civil War, things weren't great for the South. They were re essentially rebuilding uh, a, a area of the country that had fallen during the Civil War. And things were really tough for people. And it, the South didn't really kind of get back on their feet until maybe two or three decades into the 20th century. And even then, things were a little dicey. During this Reconstruction era, a lot of people had this idea of the New South. And one of the men who had this idea, his name was Henry Grady, he's mentioned here on this plaque, had this idea to turn the South into an industrial powerhouse. Uh, a lot of people shared his views. Sadly, Grady himself died before he could see any, any of his views come to fruition. I walked into this room and I thought that guy was real, and it scared me. shop here where they produced a lot of locomotive pieces for the steam engines. This is the second time I've seen a mannequin that I thought was a real person and it scared me. You can see on the floor here that there's a pattern of a railroad. I guess at one point in time there was some form of I guess maybe train tracks that were on the floor that were since been removed. 
but uh, I just noticed it. The Glover Machine Works was a very prominent steam engine company here in Atlanta where they produced a lot of pieces for steam engines and also steam engines themselves. So we're going to walk in here and take a look at what they have to show. That's what their factory looked like. See a lot of people working to produce the steam engine parts. Is that Andy Warhol? Here we see a gentleman working on a steam engine right here. So I don't know about you guys, but would you say he's been working on the railroad all the live long day? I'm not apologizing for that joke. You guys see this motor here that's attached to this belt which is attached to this rod over here, which is attached to this rod, which is attached to this belt in this machine right here. But if we follow it back up, you see the belts are also attached over here as well to this machine. And if we follow it a little bit further, this machine right here, and all of these machines connected to this one motor that's over here would take these raw materials and shape them into what they needed to be. Now this wasn't just the practice for steam engine or locomotive pieces, but this was also pieces for other pieces of equipment such as automobiles and washer, washing machines at the time. And here's another shot. The motor is right here with the belts that are going up to all these rods over here. And this one motor turns all of these, which makes all of these guys work. It's a 19th century innovation for you. And right here we have a model of the Glover Machine Works circa 1904. But Jordan, how do you know that that is specifically 1904? Well, because it says so right there on the sign. The Glover Machine Works served many industries like coal, brick, steel, and lumber. And they traveled to all of these different states. Around the 1930s, when the entire industry of the steam engine and the locomotive started to dwindle, uh, this really hurt the Glover Machine Works. They actually stopped producing locomotives around the early to mid-1930s. They did, however, stay open, and they did repair them for, for a time being afterwards. <laughs> ah, you got me. You got me. Interesting story, bro. And here is one of the main reasons we came to the museum today. It's to talk about Andrews Raiders. Quick recap. James Andrews was a Union spy and saboteur who had an idea of stealing a locomotive from Marietta, Georgia, bringing it back up to the Union troops that were stationed in Chattanooga, Tennessee, and there they were going to cut off the railroad line that led into Marietta and ultimately Atlanta, thus cutting off materials and goods that could be used for the Confederacy. Didn't really work out so well for them. And right here you see an artist rendition of the locomotive, the General, that Andrews stole. There is the man himself the head saboteur James Andrews, and as I back up, I can show you all 24 men who were involved in the raid. Right here we have a map of the great locomotive chase. The general started here. This is where Andrews got a hold of it and brought it all the way up here going through all of these towns, and as they make it up to Ringgold, Georgia, right before the Tennessee-Georgia line, the great locomotive chase ends. There was also a Walt Disney movie called The Great Locomotive Chase, which really showcases what happened. Uh, I would not use that as the exact historical document, as of the time, as much as I love Walt Disney, uh, they weren't historically accurate. There were 
historical elements, and they did tell a historical story. However, it's not... Let's just say it was embellished. We'll go with that. Follow these train tracks here. See where they lead us. I think it's going to be something pretty cool. We're going to go under the tunnel here. I didn't feel like pronouncing that name. Look at that. That's it. That's the train in question. The General. Look at how huge that thing is. Pretty crazy to think that the locomotive in that picture is right there. Check that out. I'm kind of in awe. It's very rare that such an item, or I say, I say item, but I should probably say object or museum artifact, has such a very interesting story tied to it. And then, as you're learning about it, going through the museum, you get to see the main piece in question. I've been living in Georgia a long time, and I have been here before, but it has been over a decade, and I'm kind of seeing this with new eyes. This is stunning and amazing to me. W-N-A-R-R -R for the Western and Atlantic Railroad Company. Try to get a close-up to see if I can show the working innards of the train there. It's definitely bigger than the toy version we saw in Marietta Square. Here's the step that one would step on to hop onto this little area, and they would just pilot the train. And this is what it looks like from a top view. God, I'm still just taken aback by how massive it is. Let me see if I can zoom into the little conductor's area there and see all of the stuff going on. A nice touch for the display of the general are the railroad tracks here. I mean, obviously you would have to have the railroad tracks just because the way the wheels are built, you don't want to damage the object. But I like how they go the extra mile to make all of the gravel out here look like it's, it's out in the wild. <laughs> it's the general in his natural habitat. But I thought that was a nice touch. I like that. Have I mentioned that I liked that? Here is a cookie jar in the shape of the general. And right here is a whiskey jar in the shape of the general. Another one for a bottle of cologne. There's a nice timepiece right there. I mentioned earlier that Walt Disney made a film. Here's one of the international movie posters here. There's another one. Here is the American movie poster. And right here is the coat worn by Fess Parker in the film. There was also a silent film made by silent film star Buster Keaton. And right here is a portion of a film strip for said film. Here's a Disney comic book also telling the story of the general. There is a program here for the world premiere of the Walt Disney film. We also see here that the general has been commemorated on some plates. I don't think you really make it in the world until you're commemorated on a decorative plate, but that's just me. 
And as we bid adieu to the general, we will make our exit, like most museums, through the gift shop. I asked the lady in the gift shop if it was okay if I could film, and she didn't feel comfortable with it, but she did allow me to take some pictures. So what I will do is I will drop pictures in here so you can see what the gift shop has to offer. And in typical Jordan Gasly fashion, I forgot to film an outro while we were at the museum. So you guys are getting it now in my office here, uh, much like all of the other outros that I do. So anyway, if you enjoyed the video, please give it a thumbs up, give it a like, give it a share on Twitter. Uh, if you are new to the channel, please subscribe, hit the notification bell button kind of let you guys know when I post videos. I'm usually pretty good about doing one a week. It's usually about once every other week lately. Hopefully, I'll break that habit and I'll get back to doing one a week. But, as always, I just want to say thank you guys for watching. I hope you really enjoy the video. This one was really fun for me to make. And we're going to go do a lot more history stuff around Atlanta really soon. So, until then, see you real soon. Yeah.